So this presentation, it might be best to take this just as a sort of vaudevillian interlude in all that's being said. Um, it may leave you feeling interdisciplinarity, yes. English professors, no. Uh, so that may be where you are. But in some ways, I mean, Martha asked me to come and sort of think about how, how it is that story produces theory. And in light of what you said earlier, sort of about you're gay, these new young people being queer, I actually wanted to sort of tell a story so that we could see the switch points inside gay. See where queer comes from. It actually comes from like old people's gayness. Inside our gayness are switch points between gay and trans, between gay and straight, between gay and black. And so these are the stories that I want to tell. Um, and so we'll see where that, that leads. Um, at the same time saying that sexual sameness does not exist, right? And this is uh, 15 minutes, 33 seconds. <laughs> Part one, no homo. Same-sex relations, same-sex marriage, same-sex sex. A bevy of beautiful, brilliant sameness. But here's the problem, as you know. Sameness, sameness itself is never the same. Not all sameness is created equal. Same class marriage or same class sex, we're all about it. Ask Jane Austen, that perverse hussy, in her novel, so crucial is it to keep class consolidated and forms of property all in the family that no good heroine marries a lover. No, she gains a lover by gaining a new outside brother for her sister, and most importantly, by marrying his house. And same race marriage, same race sex, so much do we love it, we tried to require it. As we all know, until 1967, you couldn't have hetero race sexuality in many US states. There were supposed to be white on white genitals, black on black genitals, though these samenesses were not equal. So why do we submit to the second class sameness <laughs> of same sex sex? Does the thing we call sexual sameness even exist? Just take me, a self-professed seeker of same sex sex, except I don't believe in any such thing. For this reason, I am not my girlfriend. We are not the same. Our genitals are different. Since mine are not hers, they are not the same. We use them differently. Their use is not the same. I do things to pleasure her a man could also do. And if she closed her eyes, she might think I were he. If she always closed her eyes, she'd never know if he was me. Let me sketch quickly our different ways of coming to what is called our sameness, a sameness so undone by the ways we've come to it. I was female assigned at birth, though I thought I was a boy mistaken for a girl. Born now, I might be trans, but I had no such concept as a child or a teen. Like a normal boy, I was drawn to girls, after we as boys got over hating girls. But since my world saw me as a girl, though I was to my mind the ultimate straight man seeking normally feminine women, I turned out a lesbian against my will, but in accord with my desires. As for my girlfriend, she was female assigned at birth, grew up to her mind normally feminine, as a rural Mormon, raised in rural Utah. In fact, she was engaged at age 19 to a beautiful man whom she would have married had he not died in a tragic car crash. After which she aimed to go on a Mormon mission, though she was having dreams of swimming in the ocean, which you're not allowed to do while you're on a mission. That's another story. <laughs> at any rate, she went to see her bishop, who was a Buddhist who had become a Mormon, that's pretty rare, and he agreed she should not go on a mission. At which point she moved to San Diego to study world religions, where she heard about the Great Peace March, a march from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., all on foot to protest U.S. nuclear weapons. On that march, she met lesbians, wished she could be one, so cool did they seem to her, but she figured she wasn't a lesbian. She moved back to Utah, started a rock band, and lo and behold, as the Bible says, she fell for their female saxophone player, who was female assigned at birth, but you know the story. And later she found her way to me. The moral of the story, if I had gone trans, I would now be he, she would still be she, but we would not be we, since we might be straight by legal definition, able to be an opposite sex married couple, and isn't that queer? <laughs> or to put this differently, my lover and I lack equal access to straight people's difference, even though straight people often practice sameness if there is such a thing. Even gay men's history of desiring straight men, when it has happened, is not quite the same as lesbian's history of pursuing straight women, if one can even generalize. In the campy film, The Naked Civil Servant, an autobiography of Quentin Crisp, who was one of England's most famous homosexuals, Quentin laments, 
I dream of a great dark man, a real man, enormously strong, enormously virile, whose love I shall win. I know that my dream is doomed to disappointment. If I succeed, I fail. If I win the love of a man, he cannot be a real man. And the more feminine I make myself, the less will the real man be attracted by me. The dream is only a dream. There is no great dark man. Ah, but there are femmes, seeming straight women who respond to what I'll call masculine not men, a problematic phrase. The good old sexologists from the 19th century didn't know what to do with the femme. They tended to see her as a normal child who, as a woman, was led astray by a mannish lesbian who had been a queer child. And I must confess, so delightful is the femme that I have a little game to cheer myself up whenever I am low, called Femmes at the Mall. Here's my phantasmatic, virtually foolproof, virtual pastime. You know what I do, hit a shopping center and imagine that every appealing woman who presents as feminine is a femme lesbian until proven otherwise. <laughs> Since I never test them, they are not disproven. And therefore, due to this generous practice, the world is virtually full of lesbians. <laughs> but on to the queer child, noticing this. I was a gay child, my lover was not. We are not the same. Part two, a child switch point. Let me begin by coming out as white and confessing that I know nothing for myself of the experience of wearing as a child any racial signifier other than white. I have been schooled through reading, through talking, and how a great variety of people of color experience wearing signs of color from their childhood in a host of contexts. And these stories are extremely profound. But let me tell a story from my white gay childhood by crossing it through the signifiers black and straight, which I consciously did as a child since I grew up in one of the few racially integrated, problematic words, towns in all of Connecticut. I'll start my story backwards, <coughs> stating that when I went to graduate school in 1979, Finally, for the first time, I met a live and breathing person who standing in front of me said they were gay. Until that time, I'd met no such person. And I remember thinking while I was growing up, it would be a rare friend, a straight black friend, who would have my story. Imagine a black child growing up inside an all-white family. She knows she's black, but no one knows she's black. She'll have to come out to her parents and siblings as a black child, since they don't know she's black. She's never seen another black child. In fact, only once in a Hollywood film, never on TV, though some of these characters strike her as black. She's read about blacks, knows they do exist, but has never seen a live black person throughout her childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, until she goes to graduate school. There could be a straight black child with this story, but it would be rare. By contrast, the story I've just told you would be fairly common for any gay child of any sort of color growing up sideways in the 20th century. Thinking asymmetrically at the switch point between black and queer helps to reveal the seeming specificity of the gay child, which I want to argue actually serves to dramatize every child's queerness in the sense of strangeness. <coughs> How can this be? So let me just put in a little capsule, just as, a, as an aside. If you're ever wondering like what queer theory is and you sort of feel like you're confused, just go to the dictionary definition, hold it right together. On the one hand, derisive slang for homosexual, says my dictionary. On the other hand, strange. And so queerness usually sort of takes the force, the signification around homosexuality and spreads that strangeness across all sexuality. Part three, our backwards birth. What a child is, is a darkening question. The question of the child makes us climb inside a cloud, a shadowy spot on a field of light. To put it less poetically, we don't know what children are. For at least a century in US culture, we tried to make the child, who is largely white and middle class as an idea, a protected interval of non-complication, increasingly safe from labor, sex, and pain. Yet the very moves to distance children from adulthood have often made them stranger, more foreign to adults. If they're seen as normative, they're normatively strange. If they're not so normative, they're threateningly strange. Four rather major historical developments scissoring with and against each other 
make the child surely strange in these two ways in the 20th century and maybe still. So here I'm thinking about the, it's just like somebody flicks a switch at the beginning of the 20th century. It's really quite remarkable. Beginnings of juvenile justice, 1899. Agitation to abolish child labor, 1901. Writings of Freud, right around 1900. The adult concept of homosexuality emerging just around 1891. Those four developments, along with many others, changed the face of childhood for the 20th century. And we're living with the legacy of that. The point is this. Children must live inside our figure of the child. And life inside this membrane is largely available to adults as memory. What can I remember of what I thought I was? The child is who we no longer are, and in fact, never were. It is the act of adults looking back. The gay child shows how the figure of the child does not fit children, doesn't fit the pleasures and terrors we recall. So there is a gay child, there is a liquid circumstance of a child lingering in the vicinity of the word gay, having a secret full-blown relationship with a concept. For many gay children, metaphors been crucial and strangely literal. By the age of nine, I thought I was a vampire, a shadowy figure with shadowy secrets surrounding women. You remember Barnabas Collins on, you know, Dark Shadows, and I would just like watch his story, and he's like a great guy, and everybody loves Barnabas Collins, but his tragic secret is ultimately just can't help but bite women on the neck, you know, and that, I just felt like, that's who I am, that is who I am. Um, I remember desperately feeling there was simply nowhere to grow. Thus, I wish that time would stop or just twist sideways so that I wouldn't have to proceed to further forms of trouble. But notice this. Even straight children have been technically not yet straight, since they too are not allowed to be sexual. The child who will be straight is merely approaching, while crucially delaying, the official destination of straight sexuality, and therefore showing itself as estranged from what it would approach. How does any child grow itself inside delay? Just think about sexuality. I mean, did your parents tell you, like at age 10, okay, now is time you could be kissing? By 12, French kissing, then a little light petting as you turn into 13, <laughs> heavy petting. That would be like a gradual approach, but this is not like what we do with children. It's like an on-off switch that we try to, to give them. This question is dramatized by the gay child who's been put on hold in such intense ways. So what I wanted to say very quickly, is throughout the length of the 20th century, the gay child is an impossible category in this sense. Adding gay to child, sounds like you've made a sexual child, which is not allowed, though the general culture generally presumes every child to be straight. The gay child finds no established forms to hold itself in the public legal field. And you're talking about children, not youth, not kids, but children. Thus, it's intensely unavailable to itself in the present tense. In fact, it has a backwards birth after retrospection and after a death. If you are a ghostly gay child, when you come out in your teens or 20s, you put to death your straight life in the eyes of your parents. You can finally say, I was a gay child. And this has been the only grammatical formulation allowed to gay childhood. The phrase gay child is a gravestone marker for where or when one's straight life died. Straight person dead, gay child now born, even though one's childhood has expired. So my question is, is this dynamic radically changing? Are we starting to talk about gay children in the present tense? And anecdotally, I actually think we are. So now my question is, what are the effects of that going to be? Will that serve to desexualize the term gay? Like if we believe they're gay children, so gay will become less of a sexualized marker, or will it newly sexualize childhood? This raises the question, are we starting grudgingly to believe in sexual children? Just look at the stories coming out in the press. Gay kids in middle school, sexual bullying, child teen sexting. And I have a whole bunch of research on what I call the African American HIV child. Meaning a lot of the research that I've done on this is looking at the discourse surrounding uh, African American children as the face of HIV. And the discourse is just sort of unbelievable. There's ambivalence that the kids are doing well. Now they're taking their fate into their own hands. They're making risky choices. The HIV African-American child is treated as if they're this massive sexual threat in the population. 
the first and foremost is their sexual threat and their sort of disease implications secondary to that. So the discourse on this is really striking. Perhaps we're in a twilight period of a gathering belief in a fearful sense of sexual children. And if this is so, does this gathering belief or worry affect where the public needs to relocate or perhaps rediscover its lost child? So, last part, last page. What I would tell you, if there were time to tell you, but there isn't time. <laughs> this could sound outlandish, but new documentaries on the child in crisis in India, Malawi, Uganda, depicting children imperiled by poverty, sex trade, and AIDS, are letting many viewers, through disavowal, relocate our Western-style innocent child to foreign soil, where it can be found in inverted form, where its innocence is a back formation from its experience of extreme peril. Take Madonna's art house documentary, I Am Because We Are, focusing on children orphaned by AIDS, infected by AIDS, in the African country, Malawi. This is not our innocent child on its long delay, nor is this our troubling child who is taking her own sexuality into her hands. This, I suspect, is our troubling child with its suffering turned back upon its head, where its harm can act like a wash, soaping, rinsing, buffing suffering into a sheen we can read as weakness and thus as innocence. Thus, Madonna asks, aren't these the fears and hopes of any child? after her film has shown us a context that bears scant resemblance to anything we've known, if we are not Malawians or those who know Malawi, where the film instructs us one million children orphaned by AIDS out of the country's 12 million people seem to be everywhere, living on the streets, sleeping under bridges, hiding in buildings, being abducted, kidnapped, raped, circumstances leading to a state of emergency. But quite perversely, it is these very differences in the lives of children that make the Malawi's children, at least for Madonna and many of her viewers, super candidates for the Western style innocent child who above all needs our protection. A flattened version of US childhood, one we've had to start doubting ourselves, is thus magically restored on foreign soil through, of all things, the sexualized, racialized, poverty-stricken HIV child. These matters now make the category childhood foreign to itself, something even stranger than a state of one's being while also delaying a temporal approach to a time it is not. Thank you for your patience.